welcome. Thank you very much, guys, for joining. I'm really excited because today I have an incredible guest, Winka Doubledom. She is a Miller Professor and a Chair of Architecture of the Baseman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. And being from Europe and having taught at Columbia, at Harvard, and UPenn, as well as having an intense collaboration with the MIT Media Lab, her teaching blends interdisciplinary approaches to architectural education. Winka Doubledum is also a founding principal at Architectonic. And today I invited her because she's an expert on digital design, and she started teaching her fully digital paperless studio on Maya at both UPenn and Columbia University. So moving forward, digital design is a norm and has reached a plateau ready to deepen the research into robotics and advanced digital printing techniques. And as she says it herself, the use of advanced digital tools allows us for blurring of the lines between design and technology. So Inka, thank you so very much to join me today at this talk. Um, I just wanted to start perhaps by asking you about your career and you know you dedicate your life to basically researching and teaching and publishing about a topic of how technology reflects and challenges established interdisciplinary boundaries and design practices why does this matter to you so much ah what a great question um i think it started when uh, when i realized that i can't think flat um, so it started with something where I was bad in. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, the best challenges for any of us to develop ourselves is to realize what you're not good at. And for me, that was uh, thinking flat. So uh, when I graduated in Holland in 1990, I was already working on tiny little computer models. You know, this was still a wireframe and a friend helped me to animate it. So it was a small wireframe animation. And I realized that. Uh, when I came to the US to study at Columbia, that uh, it wasn't that normal here yet. So um, I think for me, it's always been really important for that reason, because I can't think flat. So the computer really helped me to think 3D and to develop more complex uh, systems. But I think in general, I'm really interested in it because um, I feel architecture is an incredibly slow profession. If you think that things like a Möbius loop or Riemann surface in a mathematics was developed in 1837. That's close to two centuries ago. Um, we still, you know, whenever someone talks about that in uh, architecture, they go, it's new. And, you know, it's kind of fascinating to me how long we can say new, right? I mean, that is not new. And, um, and so I have always pushed for architecture to be maybe more intellectual, to, uh, for people to understand that we architects are scientists as well as designers, and that research is really important in architecture so that we uh, develop research groups. I'm the director of uh, Advanced Research and Innovation Lab. And it's unusual, I think, for a woman also to do that. And I'm just really fascinated by technology. I always was. So how do you integrate all these approaches into teaching? Tell, tell us a little bit more about the lab as well and the work that you're doing there. Well, in, you know, I run the department. So for me, it, you know, it was fun to build. We have a whole wall of what we call maker bots, which are um, tiny 3D printers. Um, I did that because I want students to be able to real time test their designs, not the famous, we'll make a model at the end but to really understand that model making is one way of showing how you do your work. But what is much more important is prototyping and to test small parts of your design and really develop them because of making models. So um, that's what I've been pushing at Penn. So it's not about representation um, at all, actually. It really is about gaining knowledge and understanding design in deeper levels. So we have this big wall of megabots, and then recently we built a big uh, robotic lab, um, which is super exciting. And um, that is really because a lot of manufacturing in the future is going to be like that. But it also asks from us architects that we design smarter, better. And to be honest, it's playing because you know you can design custom things that uh, now can be made by a robot in very short time. So. 
I do this in my practice also. So there's a good balance between what I do uh, in my own work and how I develop that and then uh, how I bring that to pen also. So for example, in my own studio, I teach one studio a year. And my own studio, we worked with a, a manufacturer that is a precast concrete uh, manufacturer. And we worked with him on like carbon reduction of carbon footprint and how concrete could be self cleaning or um, things like that. And then the students uh, were allowed to make in his factory parts of their building as, as we call them chunks. So you took a chunk of their building and they build it in concrete, which was super exciting, you know, because suddenly it's a, like very, the materiality of it is so much more exciting, you know, when you actually build it. Um, so yeah, we do that a lot. So the, you mentioned MIT Media Lab and when I studied at, uh, or when I taught at uh, Harvard, I had my students work with someone from the MIT Media Lab, which is kind of a bit funny, but you know, I feel like as, as a European, I can get away with it, <laughs> cross, cross universities. Um, and uh, I think the whole idea of MIT Media Lab of working with manufacturers and having research going back and forth between the practice and the academic world uh, is super uh, impressive there. And I felt, I sneakily kind of took a little bit of that into the architecture department. And um, especially for the final year, I have a lot of uh, companies that help the students either by sponsoring research, uh, sponsoring books and study trips, uh, but also by being experts for them to talk to. So it's been really fun. We have a whole group of people now that work with us, like Semex uh, is also a concrete group. Uh, their R&D center sits close to you in, in um, Biel in Switzerland. Um, we're working with uh, um, Fab a carbon fiber group in the North of Italy, uh, a former uh, bike racer uh, that um, does bikes also. Uh, so manufactures bikes, but also felt like, you know, this would be great for construction. So works with us on how to make it appropriate for construction. So we, we give a lot back and we get a lot. So it's, it's fun. So yeah, that's why. That's just amazing. I really love the combination of the both the, the test, but also bringing it into practice and being able to test it in the one-on-one -on -one scale as well. Uh, working with uh, manufacturers of concrete and actually you know, because, and, and this is the experience also that the students are getting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, our students, they go to Switzerland to work with Semex, so they come to the, the other guys, or uh, the students are working now on a carbon fiber uh, pavilion we're going to build on probably the next architecture, Biennale in Venice. I'm not sure we're going to make this one, because uh, this one, we're not sure it's opening, but I guess theoretically they could still make this one also, because the they're working on the pavilion, but um, yeah, so we do, we, we also carry the stuff around the world, which is nice. That's so very interesting because if you think about it, there is always this big conversation about how uh, we have a disconnection between education and practice. And I think that being able to find this kind of uh, studio work where students are actually getting the one-on-one -on -one experience of mm -hmm. building can prepare them better for, the, for their future work in the practice as architects. Yeah. Yeah. And I think often, you know, like when, when we think of education and uh, working in practice, it gets very often dumbed down, you know, like it becomes like a very basic design. And we actually think it's very important not to do that. So you design how you would normally design, which in our case is pretty <laughs> digitally uh, advanced, but also uh, I think design, we're, you know, design wise, we're pretty advanced. Um, so I think Ben is not exactly afraid of complex form. Um, so we feel like, you know, you want to combine design excellence with uh, super pragmatic, far advanced technologies, you know, so not giving up on any one of them, like really pushing both all the time. And that has been really fun. You know, it's, it's such a laboratory. Um, I like to think of our department more like a think tank, you know, like we really, try and um, help the students become like critical thinkers, people who can have arguments, but can also like innovate and like almost invent things. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. 
That's really interesting. Uh, I think that it's really important to be able to have an open mind. And, you know, one of the reasons why I was so interested to talk to you is because something you've been pushing for such a long time already, and you kind of created a, a norm around it is this digital technologies and really advancing the, the thought of design as well as teaching around digitalization. Uh, so now we found ourselves with COVID completely at the, at the point of doing everything digital. And I can mm -hmm. imagine it wasn't very hard for you guys to switch, but I wanted to ask how did you find that, ch that change and was it still challenging? Um, as, especially if it comes to, to your students and, and the school. Yeah, it was both, I think. You know, technologically, it was easy because we architects all work on Zoom and we're super digital. So, you know, like that was, technology was no problem. Uh, Penn was really sweet. They gave, um, they opened their uh, IT department so that students could completely download all the software they needed from wherever they were. Uh, so even if they moved back to China, they could download software um, through their account. And that was, that was really great because they got a huge amount of IT support uh, and that you need that, right? I mean, otherwise it's, you know, you have some your little laptop at home and you're trying to do the same work. Um, so that was solved really by, uh, by the bigger infrastructure we have. Um, teaching was, was kind of fun. I mean, we were lucky because we'd done the first half semester in person. Uh, we still did the midterm in person. So they just had had their midterm, like physically with everyone around. Um, and then they closed it down. So, I mean, in a way it was, was also not so hard because it was half a semester and they were just finalizing it. Um, I have to say, I thought very often, thank God, you know, that yeah. we have that already. Um, professors and, and students both were like heroic, um, really good, um, we did install a lot of things, like I, I started a chat with the chair. So on Tuesdays, I would have an hour where people could just join like an open call and hang out or just chat, you know, or tell us how they feel in their room, you know, sitting there or just compare notes. Some PhD students would come in and share their uh, thesis or uh, we really got to know each other. Actually, it was very funny because you know, the new people would come in, but then also the, the same ones really liked it. So we'd come in every week and we'd start to have a longer conversation. So we did some stuff like that, you know, because I feel like you, you want to, the spontaneity you have, like normally I would walk through studio and see how everyone is doing and chat with the professors, chat with the students and just in general get a sense of where everyone is. Um, whereas now, you know, there was no way. So I kind of made up for that by just having this kind of hour a week. Uh, and we had also very many other meetings, you know, like meetings with the students, meeting with the faculty. Um, so that helped a lot. Um, but the normal teaching, I think, was like almost uh, flawless. It was easy. And, and in a way, you know, like we are talking now, um, it's much nicer than having a phone call, right? Like you yeah. really sit together in a way for a moment in this bubble um, that we call Zoom. Um, but you know, we'd had a few students that were back in China. We would like move the studio a little earlier, have them start first, but they would like go, no, no, we want to stay up. We want to be part of the studio. And they would do like change the day and night schedule, which was kind of boring, but seemed to work for them. Um, and yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was okay. We're doing now a virtual graduation, which I think is tougher, you know, because you want to say goodbye and you want to congratulate people and send them off in the world with like a, a good push. So we, um, we recorded all like our congratulations and I'll send you a link, it'll be fun. It's on Saturday, uh, very late for you because it's six o'clock our evening. Um, but uh, there will be uh, a website within the end of the year exhibit uh, that we open at 6.15 and 6.30, there'll be like all the recordings of everyone saying congratulations. So some are just like, hey, congratulations. And some give a speech and it's very different. And uh, then we have an after party, <laughs> a champagne after party, where, you know, I basically um, share who won an award and 
we celebrate that and we celebrate a few other things, a little glass of champagne. Um, and then it's more open, so everyone can just call in, all the families can call in. Um, so it's more like the reception after the graduation. So yeah, but you know, we still think that that once we are more on site that we probably give them an actual graduation or we invite them to next year's because I think, you know, there's nothing compared to really being there. So it's good, but it's, it's as good as we can get it and it's fun. And I think it will be different and, you know, but it's, it's not, not as personal. But there's different things that we, you know, for example, our open house this year was way more fun because we had a hundred people from all over the world calling in. I had all my faculty uh, and basically my um, IT director would put questions in the chat and then I would pick up a question and I would say, oh, this is a great question for the coordinator first year. Meet, you know, Andrew Saunders, our coordinator. So I would like ping pong questions around. And so they got to meet everyone. Everyone got to talk. And for us, it was also fun. You know, we heard each other explain things. So it was, and I think that we probably keep, to be honest, because it was way more fun than normal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I've been listening and loving what you're telling me because one of my questions that I wanted to ask you related to how, I mean, I just find that so many people right now are struggling with keeping that human element, especially if it comes to teaching studio and interacting with students. And I think a lot of professors are worried about how the students can manage their education without that peer-to-peer -peer support or that spontaneous learning that just happens when you bump into someone in the studio and see what they're doing with their models and, you know, and that stuff that you can't really manage or, or coordinate somehow. And um, one of the questions I had to you is how do you think we can keep that human element despite of the fact that we are at the moment like so digitalized but i think you answered it perfectly because it's about capturing whatever there is right now and, and doing the best yeah. like using it to the best and like you said as well there's things that forced us to to experience new things but we we like them and and, and yeah. some of these experiences will keep um but other things of course will be very very nice to go back to like congratulating students in person or giving them awards in person and actually having that celebration together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, or just sitting with a bunch of people on a terrace and having a coffee. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it sounds like a vacation at this point. You know, that would be true. so nice to have that again. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, you know, similarly to education, really, architecture right now and the practice alone is actually going through quite a renaissance. And it's, it's well known to everybody that if it comes to crisis, you know, it often brings some changes and uh, my talk is, <laughs> hey, um, yeah, it brings some changes and, um, and I'm sure that after COVID also there will be changes implemented in practice. Uh, but with all the challenges right now and coming literally from all the angles, how do you feel that architects can adapt best um, to basically uh, be able to face this situation and move forward resiliently, especially if it comes to business. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I feel like I'm doing a lot of talks and lectures and podcasts and things because um, the funny thing is, we always, as an office, also, we like to work with passive solar energy and you know environmental things, but we don't do that because we want to be green or something. Just because we think it's it should be, you know, you should be like that. And, and it's just normal for us that, that you do that because I mean, the way the world is, is, it's just crazy. So if you don't take personal responsibility, like who will, right? So we've always worked with that, but I think now it's really funny because, because we are kind of known for that. And although, you know, people talk probably more about the folded glass in the folded glass building than the fact that that glass is also passive solar, um now suddenly people talk about the passive solar rather than the folding and it's interesting because you know um we architects we know a lot about systems right we under although we're not the mep engineer we do know how systems should be and what is a healthy living environment or 
how can we create buildings that are not bad for the environment or bad for the city? Um, and for us, that's second nature. So I'm getting a lot of people calling me that are in charge of larger developments or they're like, oh my God, we just think that this should be different. And you know, what do you think? And they want to make me the head of everything. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm already the head of a thing here and there. I don't need more uh, jobs. Thank you. Um, but I can recommend some people. So I, you know, it's like, there's a lot of confusion going around, but actually, to be honest, um, there shouldn't be confusion because all these issues were already there. And it's just now because people are having, being pushed with their nose on top of it, uh, that they're starting to think, oh my God, you know, air conditioning, what is that air actually containing? And um, should I be worried about it, right? Like you, it's no longer suddenly something that is innocent. Um, and for years I've been saying, don't insulate a duct on the inside, you know, it will have mold and it will have bacteria and now it will have viruses. And uh, people tend to, um, it's more expensive to insulate it on the outside. So people tend to go, ah, it's fine. Now they're like, hmm, should we replace those ducts? It's like, yeah, you probably should, you know. But it's, it's um, yeah, there is a lot of confusion, but I think, it's hopefully a reason for people to build healthier and smarter and, and innovate architecture faster um, and just think more in it. And I think, honestly, I think more sense of humor and more sense of responsibility both. You know, I think there's too much drama going around right now and not enough um, just really good critical thinking. And I think, you know, we have a lot of drama. I mean, with the amount of, especially in New York, as you know, we have a lot of drama. It's like awful what's going on. But, um, you know, hopefully it will help people to act more responsibly in the future. And, and I would think that's great for architecture. You know, that would be great for us architects and great for the city and great for the building. So, I mean, maybe out of this really bad thing, something good could come. Could come and that's what I'm pushing for, you know, to say, listen, this is really bad, but you can make it better by doing this and this and think big, you know, really think on a larger scale. It's true. I mean, it, I find it really interesting indeed because it's this whole concept of how we're adapting to it psychologically. Um, and, you know, I mean, from the, I mean, I also did it myself. Like I had a business, uh, which was film production, which is the most recent, and with COVID, out of a sudden, everything stopped. And I, I was like, okay, quickly, I have to do something so that I don't go crazy. And also to put my energy into something that fascinates me. And I was always interested in digitalization of knowledge. Um, so I, I thought that now, even more so, people are going to start experiencing it. And so I think it's very much about staying agile, but also to be able to respond to real life situations not just uh all the time being out there in this realm of concept uh but like you say quick action and being able to really um implement these response with solutions to the problems mm -hmm. uh, and i think that you know the result of all of these conversations definitely will be debates about how can we yeah. reinvent architecture uh, and I'm really interested to to start talking about this. Um, and I think that you would be a great person to ask, you know, about the future vision because you already have been working uh, with so many green solutions uh, on the scale of urban planning as well as architecture. And uh, and this is really future looking, and it's resolving a lot of the issues that we're facing right now. Mm -hmm. And even the recent post on Facebook that I commented on from yesterday. You know, how funny that you, you guys have been delivering these projects and now they seem so very relevant. I know, right? Yeah, it was just, we were talking in the office about it. It was like, oh my God, this is amazing that we just designed this. And, it's, and then it was really very much geared towards um, the idea of, let's say your partner gets Alzheimer's or your partner gets ALS or something, you know, which happens a lot. Or in a family, a, a child gets something. How do, you, how do you keep a family together and how do you not 
have to put someone in an assisted living home. And this was really, funny enough, the whole goal. And now all these assisted living and retirement homes are massive problems, right? Because of the fact that they can't uh, social distance. So it was so weird to think about that. We just made this whole community with, I think we have a million square foot of um, uh, housing in there that are all kind of private down the hill. You don't see that in that one image. I showed the center, which is a renovation of a very beautiful old um, sanatorium. Um, and that, that whole center was healthcare, is healthcare facilities and wellness facilities and sports. Uh, and smaller apartments. And then around it is a whole ring that sits on the park. There's a huge green belt there um, that are basically completely private housing, but have that health and wellness uh, facility. And it was so strange to think that we did that, you know, so recent and that now it seems to be like the solution to everything, you know, and it's so strange. I, I couldn't believe it. And we hadn't thought of it. We actually thought of it like, Two days ago, we we're like, oh my God, this is crazy. We just did this. So yeah, I was actually talking to the, the developer we worked with and we did it for the city of New York, which is even funnier. Um, but yeah, it's like, I'm thinking that, yeah, that is, that is really interesting because, you know, it was also equine therapy, for example, uh, and farm to table food and uh, many things that were, um, yeah, that actually in a way very normal, right? I mean, but there, because you're sitting in the middle of agriculture, there were several farmers interested in uh, connecting to it and having a farm to table restaurant and a greenhouse and in the greenhouse and other restaurants. So we had all these farm to table markets and yeah, it was, is is amazing because that is really where we should be going. And there I was in our drawers, <laughs> digital exactly. drawers. Yeah, and I, you know, and I just think like all these concepts of like living in the green environment and farm to table solutions, they're very often seen as a certain commodity, you know, like, oh, it would yeah. be a great utopian green city to live in. Uh, but actually now it really pro has proven to be a necessity because out of a sudden, when uh, with social distancing and, and shops being closed, we cannot have access to all the products perhaps and if we do we stay in lines and it takes yeah. so long and we endanger our actual health going out so out of a sudden it would be amazing to have that being normal like more normalized than than it is um, yeah. and I think that specifically in big cities like New York or Berlin where I live uh, you can feel it even more so how vulnerable we are as, as mm -hmm. humans living in big cities because everything is automated, everything is just delivered uh, to in kind of kind of access through big supermarkets yeah. and big corporations, and we're very um, yeah we're very disconnected from an ability to, for example, harvest nature and live of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually in shock, you know, because I have now, of course, you know, food here. I live now also in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I just had my water uh, filter change because I'm still on a well. Um, and I said to them, I want the water drinkable, <laughs> you know, like, so test it. Uh, they put a new filter in, they just, you know, checked all the, the bumps and stuff. Um, because I, I cannot look at the amount of plastic bottles I gathered over the last month, you know, and it's just like, here is one. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. It's avion. Um, and you know, you can't do it, you know, and then they close the recycling. So I'm keeping it all. <laughs> It's like, so I'm waiting for recycling to open. But it's just, yeah, it's actually very daunting to see how much uh, wrapping and stuff we have, especially in this time when you have to get everything delivered or you have to go to supermarkets and because of hygienic reasons, they now wrap everything. So yeah, it's like, um, but it's funny because I also like, I think the one thing I'm hoping, but I see myself happening is uh, I'm teaming up with several people um, to work on projects. So one is uh, we're working uh, with a company that makes uh, completely, uh, that makes wrapping from recycled materials and the material itself is recyclable. So it's kind of another way of wrapping. And um, 
we're probably going to work on their uh, manufacturing plants because then of course the plant itself has to be clean and made clean and not cannot have a carbon footprint and blah blah blah. So we're working on that with them and we're doing that with a big team of people. So I, I think, you know, in the for what I see in my near future is so what I thought of of for um Penn, like this kind of idea of of experts helping develop the projects for the students i see now happening also which i always have done a little bit but now much more extreme is like to team up with experts and to start creating projects that are deeply uh responsible and visionary in the same time you know and to actually make larger teams to get experts in the teams and to um to create answers to new questions and that's been really fun I have to say, sitting here behind my computer, having amazing geniuses on my screen, you know, it's like, wow, these people are good. So that's been really fun. And I yeah, think definitely. that's a good model for the future, you know, to, for all of us to team up more. Yeah, today I actually spoke with uh, Jacob Van Ries from MVRTV. Oh, yeah. I know you guys know each other. And it was really cool because he said something like, you know, it's such a shame that we don't have a business where like model material and like model makers could just deliver <laughs> right yeah. now to students because it would really be amazing to have this like remote business running with, you know, all these ways so that students can do physical modeling still at home. And I think that they've been finding it quite hard at TU Berlin with the education now for, um, for basically coordinating the physical, um, model making how do you guys go about it do you do you do models now or just just well we didn't we did them for the midterm we didn't do them for the final but we actually brought the students make abouts to help make masks for the hospital so our students actually produced over a thousand um, shields and masks um, for the pen medicine the pen hospital uh, to the point that the hospital said we have enough <laughs> Oh, the students got so good at manufacturing these shields because we laser cut first the shield and then they 3D printed the, the band and they started thinking of other things. And so not only did they do their own work, uh, they also 3D printed a lot of things for the hospital. So yeah, we've been using our 3D printers, um, but mostly for the hospital, not for models yeah. because we felt that was maybe more urgent. <laughs> Yeah, in, for sure, absolutely. Uh, case. But yeah, our students can. And there are in the US a lot of companies where you can send your file and the model will just be mailed to you. So even in normal situations, I, I have to admit our students do that a lot because, you know, the lines in there, we have only that many 3D, large 3D printers. We have a lot of small ones, but we have only a few really large ones. So usually the students just mail it out, their file. And they send it out, and then it comes back as a 3D model. And it's it's posted. Yeah, it's just like FedEx. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's probably much easier if you're using 3D printing for model making rather than physical models, handmade models. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's always a solution. I mean, it's a great business idea out there. If anyone wants to do it, I'm sure it would work. Uh, but I think also America is probably ahead with these kind of technologies than Europe sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, we have a lot of students that started businesses like that. You know, they either do prototyping or they do 3D modeling and make models for people. So I have quite a few of ex students from Columbia or Penn or Harvard that I know have joined up and they make a little business out of it. And they do really well because they work for big offices. Yeah. I mean, there's not only a need for it, but I think since they have such a good background in creating, you know, working with technologies and creating these working with these machines and model model making technologies yeah. why not yeah it just seems yeah. like a natural yeah i think our students might be doing that probably <laughs> yeah i don't know probably they are already exactly yeah. uh well thank you so much for um this conversation uh i really enjoyed it and i think that there is a lot of great concepts shared um, so thank you for taking the time to meet me and have this conversation. Um, is there anything else you want to add? No, keep up the good work. It's great you're doing this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for the support. I really, uh, I really appreciate that.
Yeah, and come to Penn. If we're, if we're all, once we're all traveling again, come and visit us. Yeah, definitely. I'll be in touch. But thank you so much for this. Great to see you, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.